next up, I'd like to introduce Grant Martin from Rhodes University, who will be speaking to us about Rubinia pseudoclasia. Thanks, Fiona. Um, yeah, as she just said, I'll be talking to you about Rubinia, Rubinia pseudoacacia. I'll get straight into it. Uh, Rubinia pseudoacacia, or false acacia, or black locust. Uh, it's a legume. It's a tall, deciduous tree. Uh, it's typified by this really dark, uh, deep grooved bark, really big, fragrant flowers or inflorescences. Uh, it reproduces both sexually and asexually. Um, it has uh, a very sharp and hard thorn associated with it, and it's indigenous to uh, the eastern seaboard of the USA in the Appala Appalachian Mountains. It was also introduced into Europe in the early 1600s, and it spread throughout the whole of Europe, um, for, where it's used for a variety of things. Uh, it's used commercially for honey, uh, it's used for erosion, it's also used uh, as an ornamental plant. It's also invaded uh, other countries around the world, including China, uh, Asia, Australia, and South Africa. Just to talk about the negative effects associated with Rubinia, uh, inherent with most invasives, it forms these really large monocultures, uh, excluding indigenous species. Uh, it's a big water user. It has a, a toxic protein in the flowers and the seeds and the bark and in the leaves that's toxic to both humans and livestock. Uh, the large inflorescences uh, are very attractive to bees because they're very fragrant, so they uh, compete with our indigenous plants uh, for pollinators. As I said earlier, it's, legume, it's a legume, so it adds nitrogen into the soil, so it changes uh, the soil conditions um, in some fragile landscapes where you might not actually want this increased nitrogen uh, going into the soil. And increasingly in the literature, you find a lot of references to this plant uh, that it's spreading rapidly because of increased CO2 and increased temperature. Uh, it's got a big underground biomass, so it can store a lot of nutrients underground. So just with regard to it in South Africa, uh, it was introduced into South Africa sometime before 1975. I'm not sure of the exact date yet, but maybe we'll find it a bit later. Uh, we've used it in the ornamental trade, that's probably how it came in, but we've also used it to, in soil erosion control in dongas. Uh, it has quite a widespread in South Africa, it's found throughout South Africa, all nine provinces. And increasingly in the last 10 years, we're seeing it spread where it, where it was originally just in a water course, it's now spreading up into uninvaded areas and thus has been given a Category 1B uh, invasive status in the new NEMBA regulations. Uh, that's just the distribution of it in South Africa. And what you can see is it favours already the highland areas of South Africa, from Queenstown, from Queenstown up around Lesotho and into the Gauteng area is where it's most dominant. And just to give you an example of how it's spreading, this is in the Free State uh, in 2010. And that's the infestation that's now moved in since 2014. I'll show it to you again quickly. Uh, 2010 and then the invasion of uh, Rabinia in, in four years. So what are our management options? I don't know how to stop that. Uh, well, just gonna, uh, when I asked Leslie about it, she said straight up, uh, it's going to be one of our toughest invaders to control because it suckers so profusely. Uh, but also because it produces uh, this really long-lasting uh, seed that sits in the seed bank. Uh, when I was asking some people who were clearing it in the free state uh, about the tree, they regarded it, they said it was a popular tree. And I thought they were just referring to that it grows uh, among poplars, like poplars canesis. And they said, no, it's a popular tree because when you cut one down, so many come to its funeral. <laughs> Um, so there are options to it. Uh, they have been uh, controlling it all over the world for many years. Uh, it does take quite well to chemicals. Uh, it, you can herbicide one, one tree and then it gets transported in the root system and you can actually get quite good control with chemicals. But with most chemicals, they're the non-target effects of the chemicals, of the flocculants. Um, but often chemical treatment is very expensive in uh, areas with uh, low economic return. Uh, cutting, mowing, fire, grazing just makes it angry. Uh, the vegetative reproductive just comes up everywhere. So that's not a good option for controlling it. Also the young trees are very thorny and they have this big root base so you can't actually pull out young trees. It's very difficult. What has been happening in areas where they're clearing it uh, is the com combination of the two. Cutting them down, applying a herbicide, 
which is getting reasonable control, uh, but it's often in high mountain areas, in steep dongas, uh, and it takes very long. Uh, chatting to the guys who are clearing it, they say it takes about two weeks with 10 trade implementers to clear a hectare of Rabinia, where they are clearing it at the moment. So what are the options for biocontrol? Uh, Shepard et al. in 2005 looked at all the trees in Europe that they regarded as good options uh, for biocontrol, uh, and they regarded as Rabinia as one of the top candidates for biocontrol. Uh, this was because there are no indigenous Rabinia species in Europe, but also because of the, the wealth of knowledge that exists in the USA regarding the species. Uh, there are 75 species that are known to do damage to Rubinia pseudocacia in the USA. Of these, 24 have already been worked on and they know are specific to Rubinia. There are also 114 fungal species identified on the tree in the USA and over 100 that have been identified in Europe on the tree. Uh, if we look at the insects that we have, the choice of them, there's actually a really nice smorgasbord you could call uh, of the different insects. There's leaf feeders, 35 leaf feeders, galling insects, there's a root border, borer that's specific, which is really good to, for it. Um, there are twig and shoot borers, uh, there's cankers and fungal pathogens. It's a better. Uh, so there's a, a fair amount of insects that are available uh, for us to work on. I'd love to go through all 24 specific ones with you. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the time. Uh, so I'll just go through three of them. This is a gracilid leaf mining moth. It was introduced into Europe in the 1980s. By the 1990s, it had spread throughout the whole of Europe. Uh, what happens is the moth lay oviposits on the other side of the leaf, uh, and the larvae uh, mine inside the leaves. This causes desiccation of the tree and early leaf drop. Um, it was so damaging to a tree in areas where they're trying to preserve it, they have brought in parasitoids from the USA uh, to manage it with a biocontrol program. The Cessa de Maia Gormage, it lays its egg also on the leaf, causing the leaf to fold over, and the young uh, larvae then develop under that folded leaf, also causing early leaf drop within the tree. And finally, a big cerambicid, uh, Megnocycline rabiniae, it's a highly damaging insect to the tree. Uh, the adult lays uh, its eggs in the, in the groove bark and the, the larvae then hatch and burrow directly towards the heartwood of the tree, continuously filling out their hole uh, so they can escape later. Uh, it's a great entry point to pathogens and this does a lot of damage to the tree and in the USA they find wherever this locust borer has attract, attacked the tree and the conditions deteriorate, deteriorate either too much water or drying uh, the entire tree dies. Uh, they've done a lot of work on this insect because they have areas in the USA where they try and conserve it and this insect does so much damage that it's under all kinds of um, insecticide control, therefore they have uh, mass rearing facilities rearing this insect on artificial diet so it would actually be quite easy to bring over uh, and work on in South Africa. Just a test list that we'd have to look on, luckily as I said they've worked on these species quite extensively so we know there are some that are quite specific already, but we'd have to ch test because they're for basically, uh, quite a large uh, group of uh, species, including acacias and erythrinus, uh, three crash crops, peas, beans, and chickpeas. Uh, but luckily, if we look down towards the clade where it's from, the, the robinoid clade, you'll see there are no indigenous robinia species in South Africa. Uh, the lotus species that there are there are more roadside and disturbed areas, shrub specialists. Uh, and then Cisbania uh, we'd have to test as well. Uh, just in the clade we have Cisbania panacea which is under great biocontrol in South Africa. So just, this suggests that the clade is probably really susceptible to good biocontrol. Um, so finally, just in conclusion, uh, the biocontrol success in other countries uh, that there's no indigenous Rabinia species in South Africa and the, the advantages of, clear, of controlling this species early on before it comes, becomes too problematic suggests to me that we, we should be looking at biocontrol as a, as a management option for the tree.